Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Future in Review podcast. I'm Barrett Anderson, the COO of Future in Review and host of this podcast. And for those of you who have never heard of Future in Review before, we run the annual FIRE conference, which The Economist has called the best technology conference in the world. Now, the other arm of our business, Strategic News Service, provides its subscribers with the most accurate source of information about the future of technology and the global economy. So if you enjoy these updates, uh, you can sign up for a free trial of the SNS uh, Global Report at the link in below this video in the description. And I'm here today with Evan Anderson, who is uh, the CEO of uh, Invent IP, which is an, an initiative that we created to fight nation-sponsored intellectual property theft. And we are going to be talking about the current state of encryption and why it is so important for this political moment. It's gonna be a pretty interesting conversation. Great to see you again, Evan, as always. Um, so your latest global report piece this week focuses on sophisticated threat actors and encryption. And my question for you is, if I am an average person working in tech, why does this matter to me? You know, like if I'm a, if I'm a programmer or a developer or, you know, what it might, a PM or like, why is this relevant? Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's two kind of two main answers to that question. One, I think that over the past two decades, we've kind of reached this crescendo, and we can talk about that more in a second. I don't want to get too into the weeds on it right now. We've reached this crescendo of um, activity when it comes to, you know, surveilling communications. And I think a lot of people um, tend to think of it the way that traditionally was accurate, which is, oh, that's a threat to major organizations, or if I'm in government or something like that, I need to be worried about that. And I think now, um, that's very different. That used to be kind of true, right? You know, the, the kinds of tools that people used to get into your communications, the kinds of communications we even used were more paper-based and less digital. And um, the amount of information that was really important to those threat actors in the past that had the capabilities of tapping places or whatever um, was very specific and now it's become much more general. So um, without getting too deep into the weeds, we now have a number of different nation-sponsored actors, um, much, much more capable, uh, much more active than they were even 20 years ago, 10 years ago. And they're much more interested in stealing from companies. Um, we also are now seeing kind of the, the trickle down of techniques that used to be really sophisticated are becoming more and more commonplace. People know this from their daily lives, right? How many people do you know lately that have been spearfished because their communications were, you know, um, their email was found somewhere on a database and, and um, some of their personal information was leaked and therefore a very sophisticated email was sent to them that, you know, featured personal details that seemed like they made sense. Maybe it impersonated a personal family member, something like that. I think that stuff happens to me almost every day. Yeah. And they're getting, they're getting better, right? The real point is they're getting better. So it used to just sort of be like basic spam and then phishing became more and more popular. And um, even more individual people started having trouble with more sophisticated attack types, right? Like uh, ransomware and things like that. And so we're really living in a much different moment and that's not going to um, get better anytime soon. It's cheaper now than ever before to buy these tools if you're a hacker. Um, it's easier to just go after individuals. It's easier to get their data every year. It's easier to get more data online um, on people. And so in your personal life, it does matter as well. And we'll, we can kind of get into why encryption is relevant to that and what it, what the difference is. Um, we, you and I were just talking recently about the fact that um, in one spear phishing case we knew of, if the email had been encrypted coming in, it may have been less likely. You know, if you could tell that that was coming from your trusted source, through your encrypted system, then it would have been probably less likely that the person would have fallen for it. Um, but there, there was no distinguishing between what looked like it was filtering in as real email surrounded by other <laughs> spam, right? Um, so anyhow, we, we just live in a moment where the, the pace and level of this activity is rapidly increasing at the same time, I think never before have more people at their daily jobs been um, more connected to more important data and to more data that can make you a lot of money that might be valuable to uh, both nation state actors and also you know crime syndicates that are trying to target you. So lots of companies now get targeted um, with spear phishing attacks that are, it's just about stealing money, but they're now very sophisticated and they target the CEO and get them to wire money out, things like that. Um, and meanwhile, we've got these tech companies 
lots of you so, know financial. So hold on, let me let me let me cut in for one second. Yeah. So I've heard you talk about a couple of different like types of of actors, and I want to be specific about those. Yeah. So nation state sponsored act actors, we have you know been familiar with for a, a long time at this stage of modernity. And um, especially at this age of the internet, right? No, no one is yeah. surprised that nation sp state sponsored actors are out there. I think the question that I hear a lot from people is, why would they go after me, right? Yeah. And so I think, you know, some people, th those who work in the tech space maybe are a little more uh, aware of that, but I think it's important to state that any person who works for a tech company or works for a company that is focused on innovation specifically yes. would be a key focus or a key target of those specific types of nation state sponsored actors. Right. Yeah, and here's, here's the major difference that I think people still often fail to understand, even if they're well informed about the general threat environment, and they work at a you know pretty forward looking company that's taught them a fair amount about their security practices. One thing that I think people regularly miss is that nation state actors these days are often trying to steal companies, the entire company, the way that company does business. They want your business model, right? They want to create a copycat company in their own country that has the same capabilities. And mm -hmm. so it's not just like stealing blueprints or manufacturing techniques. That's certainly, you know, strong IP that needs to be protected. Um, but people tend to get over-focused on that, and they forget that we've also seen cases of nation-state actors going after, like, the corporate communications, the internal corporate communications of a business, because they want to know how to run the business. They want to know about your bidding process. They want to know what you're willing to pay for, you know, X product that's part of your supply chain. They want to know how you do things. And so the so knowledge... it's more of, like, a general business intelligence that they're looking for, exactly. instead of just, just this, like, traditional idea of IP, which is, like, oh... Well, what, where's the, you know, like, where's the patent for the... Yeah. So I've had a lot of people that I've talked to over the years that work in, in some, you know, territory where they would probably think, oh, maybe this isn't so important. But that's not necessarily true because what you don't know is what the threat actor doesn't know and needs, right? And so if they're not aware of how to run a company that makes X product and they're trying to do it, they might simply want to read your communications and figure out how you work. They might right. want to watch how you do your bids and underbid on all of the bids that you're bidding for if they're a competitor as a copycat company. Right, right. Yeah, that's so They point. already know how to make the computer you make, or the chip you make, but now they're trying to figure out how to beat you in every deal because they're in competition with you. Right. And okay, so let's... That so, people forget. So, so, so let's go back to the to the other, like, so we, okay, so that's a good, I think, overview of, like, generally speaking, what who might be a target of nation state sponsored actors. But the right. other thing I want to mention about that, and I think that is really important to this, is like, if you are in that space, it's not just your corporate email that is at risk, right? It's also your personal email, because oftentimes, like, your personal email has very lack security, and it can create, uh, like, inroads into your corporate communications. So, sure. so that's one thing. But I want to go back to the, um, to the, to the crime syndicates thing. Tell me a little bit about that. Like, how have we seen, like, what kind of growth have you seen in crime syndicates using these same kinds of tactics just to generate money? A huge growth. And I think we, like I said before, I think we've all seen it, right? So the the business of just stealing people's money has um, become extremely digitized and much more sophisticated as these types of tools that originally were reserved for governments um, and created by governments have kind of leaked out. And that that process continues. So whatever you see, that is, you know, initially the kind of malware attack that you would expect a government to be performing, that tends to eventually become more and more available on the dark web um, for anybody to purchase and use. And so those those tools we're now seeing all over. Um, a lot of the time, it's very hard. People talk about this a lot in cyber, but attribution can be very difficult. Um, right. You don't necessarily know who's getting at you, and it takes a fair amount of sophistication and resources to figure Who that out. Who are all those Nigerian princes working for? That's what I want to know. <laughs> Yeah, and the other problem that really muddies the waters is that it's it's certainly you know par for the course for national government groups to also contract people that are the top hackers in their country, and that can play out many different ways. But you know, it's it's it should not come as a surprise that someone who is ostensibly just running ransomware attacks and trying to you know make money as a basic digital cyber criminal could also be contracted by a government team who wants them to do something for a different purpose. 
Uh, right, but I, but specifically, like specifically, I think the the crime syndicates is interesting to me, right? Because there's, as we know, there's a lot of exchange and interplay between crime syndicates and nation state actors. There's a lot, especially in Russia and 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 China, but it's been true all over the world. Um, and I'm curious. Sorry, there's my dog in the background of our podcast. He also enjoys <laughs> podcasts and wants to uh, avoid avoid hacking and intellectual property theft of his own because those dog bones are extremely proprietary. Um, <laughs> but anyways, so so I guess my question is is like with those like crime syndicate actors, how like how do we know that that's happening and what like what data have you seen about that? Oh yeah, well we know it's happening because these guys don't always get away, right? So sometimes people do get caught and you actually can see, you know, you can get DOJ case files once a, once a case is public. There's a number of groups that have been tracked that have participants that are also caught doing other things, right? And so they may be working as part-time contractors for a government group, but they also in their free time using their many and varied skills, right, can go off and, and just go go for direct money. Interesting. All right, well, I think this is a good time for us to, it sounds like, you know, we've talked about the actors, we've talked about some of the ways that they kind of try to, you know, come in through. Um, at this point, I would like to um, tell everyone, or all of our viewers, about um, a very cool new member benefit that we are offering to all SNS members starting today, um, which is uh, something that we are calling SNS Secure Chat, powered by XQ. So this is an encrypted email tool that you can use with, with your Outlook or Gmail accounts. Um, and Evan, you co-wrote the global report last week with Junaid Islam, who is the CTO of, of XQ Communications, um, which we, with whom we are partnering to provide this service to our members. Can you tell us a little bit more about what this tool is useful for and why it's important? Why, this, why is this a big deal? Yeah. Yeah. And we're going to have a members happy hour. So anyone who's a member who's listening right now, um, join us on Thursday and Junaid will join us and he'll be able to explain more about the details. He's the expert in this stuff. But um, just as kind of a broad overview, we've known Junaid for quite a while. He's made some very sophisticated, interesting tools um, over the years. He's worked with both government bodies and private businesses. So he's- He was he's actually- he if I'm not mistaken, correct me if this is wrong, but if, he was actually the originator of the whole idea of zero trust security. Is that correct? I'm not sure, actually. So I won't, I, I won't say yes or no, but we can ask him on Thursday. Um, I'm sure that's true. Yeah. Having read his bio recently, but I apologize if yeah. I got that incorrectly. <laughs> if so, that's very cool and it kind of makes sense. But um, the, the real point is this. Junaid has um, done a lot of work in encryption over the years, so he's he's very good at what he does. And we've, we've known him for a long time. He's spoken at the conference. He's a a member and a, a friend of SNS. And what is very cool about this is I've been, you know, talking to folks just like Junaid for a long time about the lack of security out in both the business world and in people's personal lives. And it's always been a running concern. And of course, like I've kind of repeated here, and I don't want to be a, you know, beat a dead horse, but we're all experiencing this in our daily lives more and right. more and more. We're losing so, more money so, every year. So, so, but what, let's talk about the XQ offerings. What is it that XQ is providing that other other encryption tools do not? Yeah. So, what Junaid's done is made it much more plug and play, which I think is fantastic. Normally, it's kind of hard to set up your own secure encrypted environment, right? We all use things like Signal, um, but it's very difficult to have that kind of encryption laced into your regular communications where you actually might have other conversations because right. you're already using the tools. So I think what's really cool about it that he is so so nicely offered to our members is that once you get this set up on your devices, you can encrypt individual emails inside the tools you're already using. So you can go in your Gmail or your Outlook and you can say, I want to encrypt this and someone can receive it even if they don't have the same service. And they can, there are different ways, we don't have to get into details, but there are different ways they can access it. So it is kind of the sort of tool that we've talked a lot about in national security circles being necessary for the new era. As we're entering this new era where, you know, things are no longer on paper, you are constantly communicating digitally, you are sharing some very sensitive information at times. Now you can just, inside the tools you're already using, elegantly just click a button and make sure that it is encrypted, which I think is fantastic for not just business, but personal use, particularly if you're kind of a high profile individual and your your personal um, digital profile should be low too, right? You should be kind of taking care of this stuff. 
So I th there are two components of, of this new offering for our members. There's a uh, secure chat, right? And then there's secure forms. And yeah. so we are offering all of our members, both of those products for free. Um, it's, if, if you pay, if you had to pay for them yourself, it would be almost $800 for a year as an SNS member, you get them for free. Um, so I think that's important to note. Um, the other thing that I want to talk about is like the special encryption capabilities that, that XQ offers through this uh, service, which include things like your ability to trace individual emails to see who yeah. has opened them, um, where they, where, where the IP address is that has opened the emails, where any kinds of like outside incursions into your emails. It's so in, if you are like, for example, sending wiring information or sending email to someone about uh, like, let's say, you know, what else would what what other sensitive things would you want to encrypt? Well, just all, all sorts of things, right? So so banking information for sure, anything to do with money or finance. Mm -hmm. But also, if you're trying to communicate with a family member about something important that involves medical records, if you're talking right. to someone about legal stuff where you don't mm -hmm. want you don't want discovery to be a problem, um, and you're not sure you can trust the you know, this works for a lot of different situations that we now find ourselves in the modern world. What's cool about what you just said that I don't think we should move past too fast is so, you know, if you're an SNS member, we're trying to put our money where our mouth is here, which is very interesting to me. And I'm very excited about it because people who have been following us probably know that we've been working on these issues for a long time. And now we're actually trying to not just warn you about them, but help you with them. Right. And Junaid was all for that. So this is really exciting. One, no, I, no one does this. Um, two, what other media organization gives you the yeah. ability to encrypt your communications as a part of your membership? None that after, I know. Of. After telling you that this is, you know, something you really need to be on, we're also giving you tools to do something about it instead of just scaring you. Um, so I'm proud of that. But um, two, what you just mentioned about the tool is also very cool, which is that you can watch packet traffic. So you can actually tell when someone's touched your communications, whether it's one of the secure chat conversations because you can have messaging. That's just instant messaging, essentially. Um, you can watch, right? You can watch where it's going. And so you can see if it makes sense that you're talking to someone in the States and maybe there's a relay, but everyone's in the US. Or you're talking to someone in Sweden and there, maybe there's a relay, but you, it makes sense where the traffic is going. It's not exfiltrating to Moscow, for instance. Um, you could also probably tell if someone was forwarding your email along to someone else, right? Like, let's just, say you sent, let's say you sent someone a sensitive business email and you wanted to make sure that they were honoring your NDA, or you sent someone in your life a sensitive email, and you wanted to make sure that they weren't forwarding your, you know, personal secrets, or I don't know, let's channel uh, Kim Kardashian, mm -hmm. like your nudes or your sex tape. <laughs> These are all things true, that you could true. use this tool for to make sure that, you know, it's not uh, your emails and your, your, your commu communications are indeed secure and being opened and accessed by the people that only by the people yeah. that they're meant for. And this, of course, we should just add this, of course, no, no form of encryption fixes. You, you added a different use case, which is not quite the use case, because if you don't trust the person on the other end, then you have problems anyway, right? And if right. you don't trust that your devices are secure outside of an encrypted message service, then screenshots exist. And we all know that. Right. Um, so you can't you can't pretend that you, you know, can't protect against problems. screenshots, but you yeah, could you can, there is a little bit of an added level of protection of yeah. What's uh, cool is the rules, which is what you're talking about. I can send an email to someone else, and in case that email gets interdicted or somehow taken from them, I have to trust them. But if if I am not sure if it'll get taken from them in some way, I can set rules for how long they have it, right? Right. So to it can, delete it remotely. It can, right <laughs> this message will self-destruct in five seconds yeah um, but i also can set rules in the tool while i'm sending my email that just say i don't want anyone outside of this country to read this and that's very cool to me i think yeah. i think what, what that means is that you for all the purposes that i can dream up for why we encrypt things i still will always be trusting the source i'm sending it to or i wouldn't be sending right. them encrypted messages i need to know them right or not know them, but know that I want this communication between us. But um, it, it solves a bunch of the different kind of basic usability and user interface problems that have been really dragging, I think, on people's ability to encrypt their communications. And so now I can just click a button, set a rule, and I can get a lot of the things that I used to wish I could get.
And that's what I would I would add, you know, we're a media organization. And though we don't necessarily ourselves work with a lot of very secure sources necessarily, uh, there are huge implications for activists on the ground anywhere in the world. There are huge implications for uh, journalists in general. Um, so if you're if you've been watching, you know, I think Evan, you mentioned this in your in your global report, but if you've been watching, for example, the protests in Iran or and and uh, like Iranian protesters being targeted because of their communications, that is a thing that is happening. And so it's it's in addition to being a tool for protection of intellectual property, I would say it's also a really powerful tool for uh, protection of against authoritarianism. <laughs> Yes. In and a different the, way. One of the interesting aspects that I think is going to become much more popular and much more obvious and, and indeed will because the PRC, People's Republic of China, does actually export often whatever surveillance tools they make. But in China, it's becoming quite common. This has always been, um, well, not always, but this has been a, um, a thing for a while where if you have a cell phone, you know, and you pass through a customs checkpoint or whatever, technically, you're subject to, to a search there. And so what, what governments will do is they'll clone your phone. They'll take a phone, copy everything that's on it in the back, or, you know, they just plug it in it, cl clone the phone. Then they can dig through it or run tools on it and they give you your phone back. Um, and that's always been kind of concerning, but particularly in an authoritarian region kind of. and particularly- <laughs> in, any, in any region, I would say. Yeah, it's very concerning, but it's, it also, mildly. it's also twice as concerning if you're in a place like China. And they're starting to do it much more on the street in real time. And so when I see dynamics like that start to emerge, that's what I'm talking about when I'm saying we're moving into a new era. That just blows out of the water any kind of security risk you ever could have had 30 years ago. Because the number of things that we store on our phone, the number of communications that exist inside of there is just baffling at this point. Um, people do their banking on their phone, right? So yeah. um, the, your, your ability to have things in your in your messaging that don't kind of lend themselves to that type of rapid real time phone cloning surveillance that is clearly the goal for certain governments is i think going to become more and more useful and more and more important for kind of you know moving forward into a very very digitized era without losing a whole lot of our privacy and freedom so um i i think we should probably wrap this up but it i I do think it is important to note that, uh, you know, with any kind of encryption tool, the your stance should be trust but bear but verify. Yeah. Verify is my version of this. Barrett Anderson, verify, but um, trust but ver verify based on what you know about who is creating the tool. So, from our perspective, you know, we have had individual experts look into this tool to the extent that we can, um, that we trust. We trust the the founder of this company, and um, it is a uh, it's a it's a data blind encryption process, which means that to the most to the best extent that we can tell, no part of XQ is actually has access to any data at any point in the process. Right, so you're sending directly to someone else. Um, Junaid will be at our member happy hour on Thursday, as Evan mentioned. So if you have questions about this technology, if you want to learn more about it, um, you become an SNS member, join, you'll get free access to the technology, but you'll also get to talk to Junaid about how it works, ask him any questions that you have about the technical rigor. Evan, really? and I, Evan and I are not encryption experts ourselves, but we have had encryption experts look at this tool to try to help us verify that it indeed is does what it says it does. Um, and so we really hope that you will become a member, join us at that happy hour, um, and enjoy the new SNS member benefit that is the ability to encrypt all of your emails and Outlook and Gmail. Absolutely. Thanks, Evan. Thank you.